Thank you, Brother Bill. And Josh. All right. Well, it's an honor to be able to share with you all, you all and uh, to share a little bit about the work that we've been participating in. And uh, uh, honestly, we've been there uh, in Eastern Europe about 14 years. And uh, it's been a, a little bit of a marathon. Um, but that's part of the nature of the work over there. The majority of the people, whether they be Orthodox or, uh, or Muslim, they feel that they're born into their identity. Uh, so it's more like a nationalism. If you're Orthodox, uh, you're just going to be that. If you're Muslim, you're just going to be that. Um, and so sharing with the culture, the people there, over and over and again uh, for years, and we see very slow response. And that's kind of the reality. We'd like to see otherwise, but uh, it's a slow work. But um, we, uh, you know, praise God, we've seen uh, some fruit. Uh, let me just share just briefly about uh, a gentleman, about a young, young man by the name of, we'll call him Tim. Um, we met him in, in our city, and he began coming to our English club. And um, there was a family crisis, and we, we gave to the family. We, we reached out in love to the family, and little by little, uh, after that crisis had passed, there was a death in the family. And little by little, the son began opening up to us. And uh, one day he, he said, Barry, what does it mean to become a Christian? It's like, well, thank you, God. Um, because it had been a while uh, since he had first been hearing about the good news. <clears throat> Pardon me. But, um, well, during Christmas, just this past Christmas, he, he committed his life to Christ. And uh, so remember Tim and, uh, as, as he follows Christ in this new walk. One other person, um, to show you the, the, the strong identity, uh, our neighbor down in a smaller town, uh, he was kind of a, a, a type A, if you please, very outgoing, very bold, kind of a, he liked to joke around too, but I found out he had a really sensitive heart. Um, my last time uh, over, uh, he, we talked about an hour, and uh, this is actually over the phone, and, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, Toward the end of the conversation, he says, Barry, if you'll send me some materials, maybe I'll become a believer. I said, gladly. Uh, but he also suggests, if I send you something, maybe you'll read my material too. <laughs> so he's, his background is Muslim. And um, so it took a long time to build this rapport with him. But he was very, he was very open. So, um, as I mentioned, uh, actually I didn't, but um, part of our, our, our presence there is working with a, a nonprofit. And so we do a type of community development as well as, well, quite honestly, our whole motivation for being there is to share the gospel. Why? As a follower of Christ, I want to see others uh, know the peace of, and forgiveness of Christ. And uh, uh, so today I want to bring to you a little bit of scripture about, as Josh said, temptation. And, uh, but to note that culturally, it's irrelevant. I mean, it covers all cultures, uh, all individuals, in unique ways. Yet, um, 
it is it affects all is, is the point. Uh, so it's kind of stating the obvious that no matter what what culture we're in, we share a common nature. Um, perhaps part of our nature, uh, human nature, some of us think parts of it are good, parts of it are not. Um, but what about this common fallen nature? Well, I'm not, I don't really want to address whether it's uh, uh, fallen or not. I mean, Scripture is pretty clear on that. And uh, I want to talk about the, uh, the tendencies of how human nature is uh, viewed in Scripture uh, in, in, in light of in temptation. Uh, so we do have aspirations in life. Uh, we have personal work, family, uh, recreation. We all want to be successful or prosperous. Uh, we want to accomplish things. We want to set out to accomplish things. Uh, that's nothing new. I mean, every culture that covers all cultures. Uh, even James 4 makes reference to this. And Christian Standard Bible says in James 4.13, Come now, you say, today or tomorrow we will travel to such and such a city and spend a year there and do business and make a profit. Well, the point, there's more to that scripture than, than I want to explain, but the point is we have this desire to go do stuff. Um, so that's part of, a, it's, it's cross-culture, it's ir uh, irrelevant to culture. So what about subtle aspects of culture? These could, could include positive aspects, such as um, we want to uphold honor and respect, as well as negative aspects of culture. That is perhaps cultural arrogance. Well, our ways of doing things are, are superior. Well, we've been doing it this way for forever, all right? Uh, or they just work well for us, so, so they should work for everybody. Um, there's also these cultural taboos. And while we were o abroad, we noticed that many of the people uh, in the culture there uh, did what they could to not show their ignorance of something, specifically um, if you needed directions to get someplace, uh, you could walk up somebody, and you'd absolutely get an answer. You'd get a, a very concise answer. However, it might not even be in the ballpark. And part of that is, um, I believe it, it is deep into cultural pride. The type that's it's caught, it's not really taught. The point being is not every part of our culture uh, can, well, or not every part of culture that even if we see our culture as uh, advanced per se or knowledgeable or or even Christian is necessarily redeemable or redeemed. Uh, but every culture has major and minor parts and uh, they're, they're prone to misguidance or uh, temptation. So when it comes to temptations, we, that is all peoples, fall under the same, uh, the result of the fall, uh, referring back to uh, the, the, the first garden. Um, Irregardless of whether a culture or an individual feels that they are, their sinful nature is part of that original sin. Um, as a note, the people we worked among, typically Muslims, uh, would say, sorry, what I do, I'm responsible for and not for somebody else. I don't have a sinful nature from, from my parents, their grandparents, or Adam, uh, the first man. So they deny uh, this sinful nature from, from the, uh, the first, the garden. Um, however, 
Scripture tells us of a common temptation, of common temptation, and how God is faithful. And thank you, Josh, for that song. That was good. Uh, God, how God is faithful, even those uh, during those trying times, during during these temptations. First Corinthians ten thirteen. Um, no temptation has overtaken you that is common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation he will also provide the way of escape that you will be able to endure it. Um, complete Jewish Bible says he will no, uh, no temptation has seized you beyond what people normally experience. It's just a different uh, wording. Uh, and it, to, the, to me, that was kind of helpful. Uh, but the point being is, we are not, uh, th there is a temptation that, that is before us, but we are not required to take the temptation, is what I'm getting at, uh, is what the scripture is saying. So let's, let's go on a little bit and look further into the dialogues between temptation and how we should respond or not. Uh, the first we'll look at is in Genesis. Genesis 3, verses 1 through 6. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of the tree in the garden? Next verse. And the woman said to the certain the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Verse 6, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Let's, uh, let's see what was asked and what was indicated here. Firstly, the text characterizes the serpent before it even gets to what he did, what it did. Uh, I think that's to prepare us for what's about to happen. The serpent uh, opens its engagement with the woman by doing something to the credibility of God. In the New American Standard, it says, indeed has God said, that would be in verse 1. Same thing as in uh, the ESV. The Christian Standard Bible said, Did God really say? Uh, and the rest of the verse continues. In other words, is that really true? Can you believe this? That God would say this. Um, quite honestly, this is undermining the credibility, the authority the holiness, immutability, and, and many other things of God. Uh, it is designed to cast doubt. Crafty as the serpent was in the mind of the woman. So the woman does respond and says, uh, well, the, the woman responds to what she had heard. She responds with the words of God but with a little bit of an added phrase. Perhaps Adam added that uh, originally, since he had uh, heard the initial command, you shall not eat it, but the woman said, nor touch it. Uh, then what happens? Verse 4, the serpent again casts doubt, and how? by a direct contradiction and twisting of God's word. You will not surely die. New American, you surely will not die. Uh, complete Jewish Bible says, it is not true 
that you will surely die. Just different uh, phrases the way the way to put it. Um, but what is this doing? It's casting doubt in the woman's eye, in the mind, that uh, that this concept of of death, which honestly, uh, the realities of death were yet unknown to, to the woman. But the greater thing is calling God an outright liar. It's, it's, it's unbelievable, totally unbelievable. God did not say this, essentially. Um, but so imagine, just for a second, how this can set up absolutely an Eve's or the woman's uh, mind. It could create a a, um, a crisis. It could, in our minds, if we were approached with, "Oh, is this right or is this right?" Um, but it it suggests if if the serpent can show that God is a liar, the serpent must therefore be right. Think about that a second. Perhaps, uh, well, if we can be convinced that the truth is, rather, truth is not, that perhaps God is not holy and just, we can easily be persuaded from an absolute to an alternative, that is, uh, alternative truth, so-called truth. Uh, if we question what we what we know and what we believe, no matter how much uh, of Scripture or how little we know, and wherever we are in life, if we question that, uh, we leave this absolute. Uh, so, to carry this out a little further, uh, the uh, the more of God's word we know. Uh, Yes, the better equipped we're going to be uh, to to avoid the uh, to be able to combat temp temptation. Otherwise, uh, if we're ignorant, if we're unknowing of certain things, we remain prone to being misled or uh, being things being taken out of context uh, by claims of others. Uh, Going back to the garden, uh, the serpent had just convinced the woman that he was correct. Uh, so then he proceeds to tell her but what the reality of his truth was. He painted this up really nice and presented it very positively, showing that the woman uh, ha could have all these great benefits, good things about partaking of the fruit, that is, um, uh, it would, your eyes will be opened and um, what does the scripture say God knows that in the day that you eat from it your eyes will be opened you will be like God knowing from good and evil so he convinced her that was enough but uh, but it took her eye took the woman's eye off of the command and focused on the, the well, honestly, the benefits. Uh, and and I mean, then she justified the, her actions in three, three clear-cut ways. That is by saying, huh, it's, it was now uh, a benefit to the body. It was a beautiful thing to look at. And it was about to give wisdom. Three things. Let me ask you a little bit uh, something here today. Do we not, uh, would we not see these as good things? If something is good for the body, it can't be bad. Oh, this thing is so beautiful, uh, there's nothing wrong with it. Or, you know, if anything that gives you wisdom or more knowledge, has got to be good. Uh, these all sound like good things, benefits, no doubt. But the premise for the woman uh, was 
justification of a wrong. It was not about making a choice between the two valid options. Regarding these three, uh, the, the body, the eye, and uh, give wisdom, those, those three types, uh, I had heard years ago that uh, uh, there were three types of sin in Hebrew thought. That seems to be logical, certainly from this passage. Um, First John also shows these same categories. And if you could turn to that. First uh, John 2.16. New American Standard said, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life uh, are not from the Father. Uh, these is not from the Father, but is from the world. I want to uh, look into these more, but uh, before we do, I want to look back at Genesis 3, verse 6. Notice one thing. The woman gave to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Note, note that the serpent, before that actually, the serpent took up the dialogue with the woman and did not even engage the man. It was not... It's not indicated why, nor does it suggest it's a, a main point of, of the, uh, the story, but the, the man freely took of the fruit. Uh, pardon. It's not indicated why uh, the man doesn't say anything, is what I'm saying, but yet the man uh, freely took of the fruit without saying a word. Uh, you could say the man was silent on the matter. But yet he was right there, hearing the, the dialogue, I presume. There's so much more to unpack on this, on this temptation, um, including consequences, uh, separation or hiding from God, guilty conscience. Uh, but before, you know, well, I'm not going to go into that today. But I want to make a comparison to yet another passage about a, a temptation where there's three temptations, uh, and that is the temptation of Christ. If you would, uh, we're going to look into uh, Luke 4, verses 1 through thir 13. And, and it goes, And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. For 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days, and when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. Verse 4. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. Verse 5, And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I will give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Verse 8, And Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And he, the devil, took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike a strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered to him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had, the devil had ended the tempt, every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. So in this passage, Jesus is fasting and had been for 40 days. Um, he's right at the end of his fast, and obviously he'll be very hungry, and weak. 
I've never had more than a couple day fast. They say after a few weeks, uh, some of that pain, hunger pain goes away, but I can't see how. <laughs> because your body still is desiring. It's crying for, for food. You, no, matter how, no matter how old you are, you've been eating since, since you were born. Uh, so uh, the devil knows that he is weak. He is vulnerable. Yet uh, in this vulnerable, vulnerable time, uh, Jesus, uh, the devil knows that Jesus is capable. He asks the question, if you are the son of God, it's as if uh, he tries to provoke him into the temptation, uh, perhaps by, I, I see it as possibly two different ways. Uh, he's perhaps invoking in the position, his position as the son of God. That's if you are the Son of God. Uh, he could maybe say, he's saying, prove it to me. And this is kind of the, the, you know, the prodding part. Prove it to me so that you can make me and your flesh happy. Another way it could be, uh, if you are really who you say you are, you better take care of your needs. As in, if you're going to be... Uh, reigning over a kingdom, you better take care of that body. That sounds like a bit more of a uh, uh, appealing to the flesh. Like you got to take care of your body to lead. But uh, this would have clearly ended Jesus' fast uh, in any fleshly means. Uh, and what is a fast for? A fast is for denying the flesh. And why? In order to seek out God, his will, and his favor. But Jesus, uh, despite the physical need, uh, he responds in his physically weakened condition by quoting scripture, specifically regarding bread. The passage is in Deuteronomy 8.3, and it specifically points out or the command to uh, to rely on the words of God, even though the words are not necessarily included in what uh, Jesus said, uh, it seems pretty obvious that he was leading up to that. Uh, so uh, Deuteronomy 8.3, he humbled you and let you, f and this is uh, speaking to the people, of Israel in the in the desert, he humbled you and let your hunger. In and he hum let me start over again. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes out from the mouth of God. Comes from the mouth of the Lord. Um, so Jesus is saying that living by words of the from the mouth of the Lord are more important than just feeding your, your body, feeding yourself. Having kind of been defeated, so to speak, on that, uh, Satan or the, the devil went on to the next he again tempts Jesus with another area. Uh, that is, the, king, the kingdoms to behold, or the kingdoms that he could see. Uh, First John describes it as the lust of the eye, quite honestly. Uh, it's suggested in a way to bring about a, a uh, that is, Satan suggests that it, uh, it's a, a, going to be a quick way for Jesus to take hold of his kingdom. But um, it's, it's the devil saying, see all these kingdoms? They could be yours. I'm ready to give them to you. But you must do something. Uh, he offers an exchange for what Jesus sees. But I see that as a, a hugely out of balance uh, exchange. That is, everything you see for 
worshiping the devil and subjecting to his authority. Let me read that verse. Verse, five, verse 6, the devil said to him, I will give you the, all this dominion, domain, and I'm reading on New American Center. I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I will give it to whomever, whomever you wish. Therefore, if you worship before me, or if you worship me, it shall be all yours. It shall all be, be all yours. So, I see this as exchanging a, uh, it's a temptation to, to see something, uh, take something that's beautiful, something that we see, or something that he was showing Jesus, and exchange it for basically worshiping and uh, uplifting the authority of uh, what Satan had or that he claims was given to him. Um, but in our own lives, the second to the here and now, in our own lives, uh, do we idolize things we see? Uh, do we put ourselves into subjection to them? Or do they take up a, a place in our heart as a treasure? Therefore, we are essentially yielding to them if they become so important to our lives. So, uh, in this Jesus, in this temptation, Jesus directly, we could say, sparred with the devil, uh, in, with the devil's proposed bargain in order to worship him. Uh, Jesus clearly and boldly proclaimed that only God is to be worshipped. So, it's not about what we see. It's not about things that are beautiful in life that we we subject ourselves to but we yield ourselves to god only the third temptation is to me it initially seems kind of odd uh, but when it's understood in the under uh, put under uh, the idea of appealing to ego or pride, then it starts to make a little bit more sense, or perhaps even false humility. Um, First John uh, calls it uh, the boastful pride of life. So here the devil appeals to Jesus' personhood, uh, or perhaps his position to to, uh, well, let's just put it this way. He, he kind of, uh, he, hmm, he appeals to Jesus' personhood, yet it seems to be come across in a reckless way. Uh, it says, it's like the, uh, the devil is saying, if you want attention and uh, if you want your authority to be upheld, Let's let's get those uh, uh, the, those angels. Uh, come on, let's get them going, and they, they'll they'll support you. And not only that, they're gonna uh, you, the people all around in this temple where he was, Pinnacle of the Temples. They're gonna they're gonna see this somehow, and that's gonna be part of your kingdom. Uh, that's maybe kind of an odd way to put it, but um, but the verse that. Uh, is quoted, Psalms 91, verse 11. Uh, the devil says, He will command his angels com concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Um, well, first of all, the devil didn't say in all your ways. He just, he conveniently left that part out. Uh, he says only, uh, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you. That is, uh, to protect your, your being, your physical self. Or, uh, But in all your ways, totally changes the context of what, from what Satan was trying to say. 
kind of bring that to a close. Uh, in every one of these temptations, the devil is appealing to one of those factors of you know, the physical, you know, the body, a, a visual uh, pride or power, perhaps, uh, which are all rejected as worldly desires in First John. Uh, just repeating that verse. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but it's from the world. That's First John 2.16 once again. Um, usually when I look through Scripture, I don't consult uh, commentaries, uh, certainly not at first. But this time I did, and uh, there's one by John Phillips, and he had some very interesting things to say, a few interesting points to bring out. And he uh, brings a lot of these same things together, quite honestly. Um, he makes a direct connection from these three temptations noted in 1 John to the garden. He makes reference to that, as well as to the temptations of Jesus. And, and he has, on the first temptation, um, his comment is that Satan presented to the Lord, the first temptation that Satan uh, presented to the Lord in the wilderness appealed to the flesh. Fleshly temptations do not necessarily come from sexual desires. It can simply... Uh, it can mean simply satisfying a legitimate desire in an illegitimate way. The lust of the flesh is one of the world, world's devices for weaning us away from complete trust in the goodness and faithfulness of God. He goes on, uh, Phillips goes on, the second lust of the world is a showy appearance for all that is in the world the lust of the eyes is not of the Father, but is of the world. And that, again, re referring to 1 John 2.16. The world knows how to catch our eye, does it not? And to draw us into this or that uh, or the, the other form of lust. The devil, in other words, knows how to package and merchandise his wares so they appear attractive. And one last thing that uh, uh, Philip says, the third lust of the world is a shallow applause. Where does that appeal? To our pride. Uh, for all that is in the world, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Pride is the ultimate sin, the original sin, that the, uh, that, uh, the sin that transformed the brilliant uh, Lucifer into the very devil himself, he, he says. Uh, so these temptations, let me just kind of sum up how can we, how do we deal with temptation? How do we, um, how do we bring this into our own lives? Well, clearly we have a comparison between rationalizing and justifying. Well, it's not really the disobedience, it's really that there are benefits to this versus this has no, nothing good in it. What you're doing, as in Satan tempting, it has nothing to, uh, to benefit me because it's clearly uh, subverting God's word or, or undermining God's principles. Um, I... I would say that Jesus is our example on how we can avoid being taken by a temptation. Now, again, being taken by it, not being tempted. Uh, but Jesus focused on seeking God in all. He sought to carry out the very words of God. Uh, and one, a couple of things. That urges us to know God's word and to practice it. Essentially, the better relationship we have with, with Christ, the, the 
the closer we will be to, to walking with him. And the temptations, if we're walking closer to, to Christ, those temptations will be less attractive, I would put it. So, now, if to know God's word clearly takes time. Uh, it Years, perhaps. I mean, I'm still learning. I'm still learning God's word. But it certainly takes uh, memorizing, studying, and focusing. Uh, it, it's, it's not a matter of just hearing it and just going. Uh, it takes time, but it, it necessitates. It, 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 we must uh, take time to spend in God's word uh, regularly. Uh, otherwise, uh, if it... Like when we learn language overseas, if we just learn one word and memorize it one day and forget it uh, a month later when we came to needing that word, I wouldn't remember it personally. So similarly, if we use something, if we practice it, uh, it'll be there with us. Um, here at Bethel, there's another way I think that we can help uh, others around us uh, in their walk. That is, in, here at Bethel, we have this one anothering and this caring and helping for those around you in our community, Bethel community. Uh, you could also say that we, are, uh, we uphold one another. Uh, I believe this adds a layer of accountability. And uh, if we undergird or support those around us with scripture and love, of course. Uh, it can lead to, to aid those who may be going through struggles, through temptation. Um, great or small, we can, we can help those by encouraging. And then there's also that admonishing. Well, we've got to be careful here, too. Um, but finally, let me just say, comparing the the Garden of Eden versus uh, those temptations there and what Jesus was tempted with. One of those was divulged, uh, uh, not divulged, but taken. The, the temptation was there and it was uh, taken, uh, followed through with uh, sinful action. However, on Jesus, uh, the example of Christ, he showed us how we could uh, shun or not go through, follow through with temptation. Uh, just because there is a temptation does not mean there is sin. If you're tempted to lie, doesn't mean that you are sinning. You say, no, I want to be truthful about this. Uh, there's only sin when we fall into the temptation. The man and the woman in the garden were tempted, rationalized this decision, and sinned. Jesus was tempted, but remained faithful. And he focused on godly things and God's word and did not sin. Amen. So I encourage you to, uh, to look in God's word, to, to see how, even Christ's example, how... Uh, we are, we can be benefited by knowing God's word. I mean, what did Jesus do every time he quoted scripture? So knowing God's word, having that tight, that good walk with God, personal walk daily is vital.